bit change here. This just allows me to activate more of the scenes. Um, the next thing we're going to look at is the telephoto bar, and that is the little three trees over here with the blue box inside a black box going to an orange box going to a single tree. So this is representing the zoom capabilities. Right now the camera's got a 26 millimeter wide angle lens built into it. If we start to zoom it optically, the lenses are going to move in and out and it's a true representation of what we're seeing. When we start going into digital, the camera's going to start zeroing in on that part of the sensor. It's not a true ver uh, vision of what you want to see. So we'll just demonstrate this. I won't choose anybody in particular. We'll use the head display at the opposite side of the room. Uh, so you can see the lenses moving in and out. So this is a true representation of what we're able to see. So that gets pretty close. I get my picture halfway down. Yeah, that's a pretty doable picture, not real good. But if I continue to zoom in, now I'm into digital zoom. The lenses aren't moving. The camera's just interpreting a spot on the, the sensor. And you can see the pixelation, uh, distortion along the edges. It's harder to hold the camera steady. Uh, digital zoom really doesn't do you any good whatsoever, so try and stay away from that altogether. <laughs> I really don't know why we put it in cameras, but it doesn't do you any good. The biggest thing to remember when you're underwater, though, not to use any type of telephoto whatsoever. You want to try and get that lens as wide open as possible. Photography is Greek for the creation of images using light. Right now you're allowing this much light to come back into your picture, so it's going to make for a better picture. If you start to optically zoom, you decrease the amount of light that can come back into your camera. So you're decreasing and decreasing, it looks like you're getting closer and closer, but most of your telephoto shots aren't going to have the proper exposure, the light isn't there, and you're decreasing the amount of view that the camera is interpreting. So a rough rule of thumb underwater is fingertips and fin tips. You should be able to take a picture, put your camera down, reach out with your fingers and touch your subject, or at most extend your leg and the tip of your fins. Your uh, subject should be within that range. Six to eight feet for external light sources is about the optimum. The light has to go through a medium 600 times denser than air, bounce off the subject and come back to you. In effect, it's traveling 12 to 16 feet, and that water's just sucking the power out of it. So uh, zoom with your fingers, or zoom with your fins, not your fingers. If you think you're close enough, get closer, get closer, get closer one more time. So that's the zoom aspect of it. Uh, right up, uh, the next one over is the icon. We do have uh, a counter as to how many pictures are available to me. I don't have an SD card put in this camera, so I've got one picture for me left at a 14 megapixel setting. So this is the highest resolution the camera can shoot in. If we play a game and come down to size, we can also shoot in 8 megapixel, 4, 2, or a VGA setting as well. So if you're trying to email a lot of pictures and stuff like that, 14 megapixel camera, the pictures can shut down a server if you send too many of them. So you can put it into these lower settings as well. I had one picture available to me at 14 megapixel. In that same amount of space, I now have 19 pictures available, so it goes up exponentially. However, if you shoot a picture like this, it turns out to be your National Geographic photo shot of a lifetime, you're going to be lucky to blow this up to a 4x6. You're going to get pixelation, it's going to be distorted, it's going to be blurry, it's just not going to be a good picture. You can always downsize a uh, big picture into a smaller format. You can not take a lower resolution picture and increase it. So. Uh, I would tend to shoot everything I could with the lower, with the uh, best possible uh, uh, image size just for the sake of uh, being able to blow it up to poster size if I want to somewhere down the road. Uh, the next one over, this is the INT. This is actually if you put an SD card inside the camera, that will come up and that will effectively change the number of pictures as well. Now with this camera we can take up to a 32 gig SD card. At full 14 megapixel that's about 7,000 pictures roughly two and a half hours of video. Because of the HD video with this, you do want to make sure you have a class 10 SD card. We distribute the Dulkin cards through Sea Life, uh, SanDisk, Toshiba, Kodak, uh, PNY, all of the brand name cards should be fine with the camera. Uh, if you see a Nakahura Takayaki card for $299 for a 32 gig card, you tend to stay away from it. You, don't, you want to stay with the brand name cards as well. When you get an SD card, put it into the camera, most devices are going to start recognizing the SD card. You can write to it right away. I'd recommend doing a hard format and make that card specifically for that camera. Don't change it out between different cameras. Even two C-Life cameras can have little 
idiosyncrasies between them. So you want to keep that SD card specifically for that purpose. Uh, after about 30 seconds of inactivity, the back of the screen goes to sleep. You can tell the camera's still awake. There's a green light on top and the lens is extended. So just touch any button and it wakes it right up again. Uh, the next icon over is going to be our battery life. We do use rechargeable lithium batteries. Uh, they have about a two, two and a half hour life on them, roughly 250 exposures, about an hour and a half of video roughly. Uh, so the better part of a two tank dive. I always have at least two batteries with me. One's always back in the room charging. One of the downsides with the DC-1400, in my opinion, is that it charges, the batteries charge inside the camera. So if you're trying to charge your batteries for the next day's dive, but you also want to take your camera out to dinner, you're kind of stuck. So I've always got two batteries with me, one charged, one dead, one alive, two dead, but I've always got one back on the charger, back in the room, so I'm constantly rotating batteries as well. So we do offer an external charging tray, comes with the battery, the tray, the AC adapter, uh, it costs about $50, but you can never have enough batteries. Um, this little box down at the bottom is called a histogram. I'm sorry, are there any questions at all? Uh, the histogram is a graphic representation of the colors that the camera is interpreting. If you end up with a lot of images over on this, uh, the left-hand side, you've got too much dark or black images. If you end up with too much over here, you've got too much white images. So uh, left, black, right, right light, if you will. You just try and get a nice level bar going across here. Uh, a lot of people use a histogram primarily for post-photo editing. It's a lot easier with programs, if I can have this spike right here take my mouse, click on here, and drag this down, and all of the other colors would change correspondingly. So uh, it's really good for po post-photo editing. We can get into more of that in a little bit. But. And then we have the, uh, the image size, the scene setting that it's in, and then the date and time at the bottom of the camera. So, any questions on that at all? Those are primarily the icons on the screen. This is your most important one. Uh, if we continue to go down, we do have a white balance setting. Right now this is set up for white balance, or an automatic setting. Uh, again, if you didn't go through the easy setup or the scene mode, this is another way to change your white balance setting to blue water less than 25 feet or greater than 25 feet. Or you can do green water around here. The scene mode and snorkel mode are really good if there's something red and yellow and orange at depth. Out on Lake Michigan, I know everything's covered with a nice brown layer of silt external flash. I don't even try using these in those settings. But if you are down in the Bahamas and you've taken a picture in less than 25 feet blue water setting and it's still too red, you can come in here and kick in a green water setting. It introduces less reds and oranges, so eventually you're going to find the good balance for it. Uh, you can white balance based on incandescent light bulbs, cold and hot neon lights, uh, white balance based on a sunny day, a cloudy day, and we still can do a manual white balance. If anybody's ever been to Kathy Church's school stand in Grand Cayman, she advocates white balancing. You put a white slate in front of the camera at your certain depth and execute a white balance, all of the other colors change accordingly. The only problem with the white balance is every time you change your depth by as little as 10 feet, you should execute another white balance. There's that much change in the colors in the depth. And so uh, it's more time consuming, it does eat up battery life, and you've got to be more cognizant of your depth at all times by doing a white balance, but you can do it with the camera. Dive in snorkel mode is going to give you about a 25 foot variance before you have to make any type of adjustments. Any questions? Too much information. <laughs> <laughs> uh, image size we've gone over. ISO used to correspond to the old days when we'd shoot film. We'd have a 64, 100, 200, 400. The higher the number, the lower the light we could shoot in. <coughs> However, the higher the number, the more grainy the pictures actually became. It's the same with the ISO with a digital camera. You want to try and have this as slow as possible to have the best possible resolution to it. So we can shoot in 64, 100, 200, 400. We can go up to 3200, so we can shoot in a very, very, very dark room, but the pictures just aren't going to be that good. Bless you. More wine? No. <laughs> um, because of the uh, you know, you're either shooting in broad daylight or you're using some type of an external flash or uh, uh, C mode or snorkel mode, try and leave the ISO as low as possible. Color is fun to play with. Right now, we're shooting vivid color. So if I take a picture of Jenny's top, it's going to represent that true color. 
If I come over to Vivid, the hot colors, the purples, reds, yellows, are going to be artificially enhanced by the camera, so you're going to get a brighter pop of the colors. Uh, if anybody's ever been to the old West Town and you sit in the bathtub full of, uh, you know, the bottle of whiskey and the can-can girls in their dresses and stuff like that, those are shot in sepia. Uh, this is a real nice, rich copper color to it. I love taking pictures in sepia because it looks like I'm taking a picture of a shipwreck with technology that's 100 years old. What's really neat with this, too, is we can put this into video and choose these colors, and you can swim down the length of a wreck and make it look like you're taking a movie of a wreck from 100 uh, people get tired of, of color. Every once in a while, start shooting some black and white pictures, some portraits of people in black and white, shipwrecks in black and white. They look very dramatic. We've got some friends that their kids have never had a color picture of them taken during schools. They grew up in black and white. And it's really interesting watching these kids grow from six months old to high school in black and white. But mix it up. People get tired of seeing colors. For land purposes, we do build in a, a blue, red, green, yellow, and purple filter. If you're trying to take a picture of a big uh, green grass field with green trees and white clouds in the background, throw a green filter in there. The green's going to accentuate the green in the picture, and it's going to pull other colors out of the clouds and make them look even fluffier, more three-dimensional. So just play with this. It doesn't cost anything to shoot in digital pictures. You don't have to buy the film. You don't have to process it. Just put it on your computer, see if you like it. Uh, image stabilization, this is where we can turn off and on our little handshake just to make sure the camera is as clear a focus as possible. Capture mode is fun to play with. Right now I've got mine set up on times one. So if I hit the shutter button once, it's going to take one picture for me. If I come to spy mode, I'm going to change this into a time-lapse photography setting. So every 10 seconds, 30 seconds, 5 minutes, 30 minutes, or an hour, this camera is going to wake up at that interval and take a picture for me. So if I try to get a picture of a jawfish or a garden eel, every time I start to take a picture, it ex I exhale, it goes back into the hidey hole. You set the camera up and uh, an aquapod or a tripod mount of some type, hit spy mode, back away from it, and it's just sitting there taking pictures of these little creature creatures that don't even realize their pictures are being taken. You end up with some amazing shots. Great for a sunset for just catch that. Out. Exactly. If you like uh, watching sunrises but don't like waking up in the morning, Set your camera up the night before, hit the shutter button, go back to bed. How, how does that affect the battery life? If it does it, um, so if we did the one hour setting, mm -hmm. how long will that keep going? Oh, it's going to last days and days and days and days, days of okay. one hour setting. Yeah, cool. So it's only using the battery when it wakes up. Yeah, so yeah. Eight, the it back of the up, screen is the biggest shot, draw on the camera, down. and so that goes dark. The camera wakes up at that shutter interval and then does an automatic focus and then goes back to sleep. So that it, it's on standby, it's going to last 20 plus hours, I would think. I've never timed it to see how long it takes. 